Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live from beautiful Cape May County, New Jersey. Uh, be, uh, live, come on, Melanie, get it out. Live via SHR Media <laughs> and streaming live on Facebook as well. I'm so happy to be back here uh, on Money Talk with Melanie today. My guest for the first hour is the one and only Mike Fitzpatrick, cybersecurity expert and founder and CEO of NCX Group. We're going to talk today about the world's largest acts. I'm very excited about that. That's going to be fun. And then my second hour, I have... Anne Ballou, who is an emotional intelligence coach. I'm going from alpha male to intelligent <laughs> to all girly uh, emotional intelligence coach. And what she does is she specializes in emotional intelligence for women in business. So I'm excited to talk to her. She's a writer for Forbes, an international speaker. She's written over 26 books. And she's going to talk to us today about why emotional intelligence is the answer to rising strong. I trust that uh, both conversations will be interesting. So I'm excited about the show today. I'm just excited to be back on the air, quite frankly, because I haven't been on the air in two weeks. Last weekend was my birthday and I celebrated 49. Thank you, Lord, for another year. Um, I'm just so appreciative that you get to live. In, any year that I get to live, any time that I get to celebrate another year. I know people get bummed out about their birthday, especially as they start to get older, but I just don't do that. Um, and I understand it because you're not the same person that you were when you were younger, but for God's sake, I think that's a good thing. A lot of times, hopefully, if you're the type of person that's growing, that's a, that's a good thing. So last weekend was my birthday and I didn't, I didn't do the show because um, I wasn't sure what in the world my friends or my sister might have had planned on that Friday. So I kind of left that date open, but I'm, I'm extremely excited to be back on the air again. Uh, let's talk about some money talk news. Old Navy, those of you who are familiar with the gap in Old Navy are uh, planning a massive expansion of 800 new stores as it moves to become a standalone brand. So they are actually doing the unthinkable and getting off the online platform and just having brick and mortar stores. Now, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm kind of, I, I go back and forth um, because I, I actually, for, for one, like uh, Old Navy a lot. I like the Gap and Old Navy. Um, the Gap is going in the other direction. It does, for those of you who don't know, the Gap and Old Navy are owned by the same company. Um, so what they've decided to do is, is this is their strategy, is to do more online with the Gap and more brick and mortar with Old Navy. And Old Navy apparently is what really keeps um, that company going. I forget what the name of the overall company is, but apparently they also are Banana Republic. For those of you who are, under, I, I, I am the uh, the Gap, Old, Old Navy, Banana Republic extraordinaire. Banana Republic's more high end. Um, the gap is somewhere in the middle and then old Navy is your more economical, um, store, but they're going to do more of those more brick and mortar at, listen, maybe they'll get one in Cape May County where I live. That would be nice, <laughs> but they are, uh, but that's what they're doing. And I think it's just going to be a really interesting thing to watch, to see whether or not that's going to work out. I think it's, it's kind of like an innovative, um, thing, thing that they're doing because most people kind of do more online and are closing more brick and mortar store brick and mortar stores. So we'll see how, how well that works out. I hope that it does. Um, in the world of Google, don't be evil, but, but the company is kind of evil. I, I know I keep saying that one of these days, they're going to cut my Google off, um, <laughs> but it's true. They got another warning uh, from the government. This time the warning was because they were not letting employees know that they are able to speak about their working conditions, their wages, and other topics. And this is according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. Apparently, they were trying to prevent their um, their employees from talking about that kind of stuff. The National Labor Relations Board said uh, that the search giant tells its market force that contrary to the company's rules, they are free to share confidential information, which is interesting. Like I said, this is according to the Wall Street Journal. 
Uh, and another little tidbit about Google, they have to pay a $550 million uh, fine to France because French financial officials determined that they had not disclosed all of his activities in the country. Now, I mean, to put that in perspective, you know, for Google, a $550 million fine is probably like, I don't know, five $550 to a, a middle class person. It's not all that much money for them, but they, but they have to do it. They've been fine. Google has not been, you know, they're really not behaving themselves to, to put it, to put it mildly. And with the upcoming election, I'm becoming more and more concerned about, about their activity. I think their mantra is don't be evil or, or something like that, or be good, something, like, <laughs> something like that. But they, they are definitely involved on both sides of the aisle as far as contributing money and things like that. And I, I, I'm really growing more and more concerned. And I have a feeling that, uh, Mike Fitzpatrick will have something to say about my concern, my concerns about Google. Probably something along the lines of "I told you so." <laughs> I told, but we'll see in a few minutes. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is that California, good old California, where Mike is from, uh, just passed a bill uh, limiting rent increases. In other words, rent control. So apparently, landlords are not allowed to increase rent past 5% after inflation. And they're joining uh, Maryland, New York, and good old New Jersey, where I reside, uh, as the only states with some form of rent control. So this should come as no surprise um, to anybody, really. What's ironic about California, though, is that they have such a huge homelessness rate. And I just feel like it's going to make people pull out and people not really keep their properties up as much as they're supposed to, because now... They um, they're gonna they can't make as much money as they need to. It's a really big problem in California that they have going on with the homelessness issue. It's terrible. And then one last note: uh, the world's biggest retailer, the one and only Walmart, plans to expand unlimited grocery delivery to more than half the country by the end of the year. I'm not gonna lie; I'm excited. Right. <laughs> I was excited when I read it, uh, and and uh, now that I'm reading it again, I, I'm absolutely giddy. I already am a staunch Walmart pickup person. They get they gather your groceries for free, people, and then all you have to do is go pick it up and sit in your car and call them and tell them to bring it to your car. So I don't know if there's anybody out there who has not done Walmart pickup. And Walmart, you know, feel free to cut me a little check. I'd appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but um. Walmart is is going to do that for half the country. That's part of what they're opening up. And I think uh, part of the reason why they're doing that is because Target also has a delivery mechanism. Uh, Whole Foods, Amazon offers discounts at Whole School at um, Whole Foods for its Prime members. The competition out there for our dollars is getting thick, and we're benefiting for it. So I'm not exactly mad about that. Okay, and that's the end of the Money Talk News. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. My guests for today's show are the one and only Mike Fitzpatrick and Anne Boilu. I cannot wait to talk to both of them. We'll be back in a few minutes. When people on the political and moral left tell you that all viewpoints should be heard and respected, do not believe them. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, for many years we've witnessed first gay and LGBTQ parades, primarily during the month of June, to displace the one-time tradition of June being the wedding month between men and women. They even took God's rainbow, and with a minor change, they made it their own symbol. While people on the political and moral right do not agree with unnatural lifestyles, They never, ever sought to prevent unnatural lifestyle practitioners their freedom of speech. Unfortunately, far-left hypocrites viciously attacked about 200 participants in a Boston straight pride rally in support of the traditional God-ordained marriage between men and women and securing our borders. Both Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and fellow leftist Ms. Presley falsely labeled the parade as white supremacist, despite there being a good number of black American participants As per usual, the leftists tell lies to tear down others. And because 
their own ideas are usually negative and destructive. To prevent the destruction of our America, stop electing Democrats and rhinos. I'm Ron Please check out my website, theronedwards.talkspot.com. That's theronedwards.talkspot.com. Ron Edwards, the new voice of America. Making a living can be tough these days with so many jobs going overseas. If you love numbers and puzzles and want job security, you can become a tax specialist with an amazing six-month tax course from Tax Mama. Operate your own tax practice locally or anywhere in the world where there are American taxpayers. It's a great way to write off your trips to visit family for months at a time. Everything you need to pass the IRS three special enrollment examinations is included in this course. Visit irsexams.school. And if you need more than six months, that's okay. Take your time. You're in the course until you pass the exams or until you unsubscribe and reject Tax Mama's emails. Right now, you can get the credit you deserve. Just visit MrCreditRepair.biz. Let their expert credit repair specialist remove late payments, charge-offs, collections, even old bankruptcies fast and easy. That's MrCreditRepair.biz. Why go anyplace else? Increase your credit score today. At Mr. Credit, you always get a quality service all at our everyday discounted price. Stop getting turned down for cars, credit cards, or even new homes. Visit MrCreditRepair.biz today. That's M. Our credit repair dot biz. Your credit repair is our number one priority. And we're back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. And my guest for this first hour is the one and only Mike Fitzpatrick. He's a cybersecurity expert, founder and CEO of NCX Group Security. And he's going to talk to us today about the world's largest hacks, which I'm very excited to talk to him about this today. And before we move on and get into the topic, can you tell the audience a little bit about, about your background? If there's anyone who doesn't know you listening to you for the first time? Well, absolutely, but it's awesome to be with you. It's been forever, and, you know, I look forward to these things. So uh, I'm ready to rock and roll and bring some fire. So, um, All right. A little bit about me and my firm. Uh, my name is Mike Fitzpatrick. I'm CEO and founder of NCX Group. We work nationally and internationally with clients and banking, um, healthcare, education, finance, uh, retail, uh, to mitigate the risks associated with today's technology. And we've been doing this for good night, going into our 19th year now. So uh, that's excellent. Save, saving people from themselves is what you is what you is what you're trying to do anyway, right? Well, you try, right? I mean, it's a it's a lot like being a um, a, uh, a left tackle in the NFL. You try to protect the blind side. <laughs> exactly. So before we got on the air, or, or actually before we got on the air, you and I got on the air. I was talking about Google and how much trouble Google has been in lately. Um, they've been getting fined left and right, but the fine, in my estimations, have not been strong enough to really a- affect them. But they've been doing all kinds of really naughty things and uh, getting in trouble for it. You know, I'm with you on the fines. The fines really for Google, for Facebook, for some of these large multinationals are really a drop in the bucket. Now, the problem is, they're keeping with the rules to a certain degree, but they're also negotiating down the fine uh, considerably uh, through through legal channels and, and that type of endeavor. So it, to me, it's interesting. I, I think I'm looking forward to the day when there is a trillion dollar lawsuit for one of these breaches, because the only way that you're going to get somebody's attention, the only way that you're going to get one of these corporations attention is a massive class action suit with trillions of dollars in the lawsuit. Oh, uh, you're probably right about that. I'm the, listening to what you're saying. And uh, how would you go? It's really difficult to fight someone like Google, because as I mentioned in the open, they're on both sides of the aisle. They have so much money 
that you have, you know, Democrats and Republicans both taking money from them, which which is wise. I mean, I, you, you see that a lot in local elections. You know, somebody who owns a restaurant or something like that, they donate to both parties. That's not necessarily very uncommon. But when you have a company as large as Google, sometimes you have them kind of pick a side, but they really have not. You got your rhinos and you've got your Democrats that, that are in the right positions and on the right committees that Google is paying to keep the government out of their hair, basically. Well, that's true, but Google's far more, uh, their donations are far more on the uh, left side of the aisle. I mean, surprisingly enough, when President Trump was not President Trump, the vast amount of his donations were on the left side of the aisle because, you know, he was a progressive for 40 years. So it, it's interesting how the, the business side of this uh, shakes out and how it plays out uh, at the end of the day. It's, um, it's interesting as you're going through your monologue and talking about the influence of corporations, and especially Google on free speech, there's a great sci-fi uh, television show that came to mind. Um, it came out back in 2012, and the name of the show is Continuum, and it's available on Netflix, and if you haven't seen it, it's well worth the watch, because, uh, sure, it involves time travel, but it's in t- it's set in today's time period in 2012 on, and it's with technology that's probably within, except time travel, uh, <laughs> within five or six years. So it, it's it's really modern, current, and up to date. But it is about the rise of the corporations and the um, takeover of Congress by the corporations. That's the whole theme of this, and it's set 75 years in the future from 2012. So it's it's a really interesting take on what we're dealing with now in our politics. That is a frightening thought because it's so, I mean, we so, it's, to me, I feel like the way politics is integrated, uh, the way corporations are integrated into politics, that's really close. It's really close to home now. I mean, they haven't taken over, but the influence of corporate money in politics is scary. At least I think so. Well, a little. You know, it, as it, long as they're on my side, it's not scary. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 the whole thing is really, it, it's really interesting how it shakes out. I mean, everybody, if you look at the money on the left, um, you know, the, the, you know, the left hated the Koch brothers. Well, the reality is the Koch brothers were libertarians. Right. Donated heavily to both sides. Uh, but, the, but they have no problem with the money from George Soros, Mike Bloomberg, uh, the rest of the leftists that are, are, are spending billions of dollars to move us away from our constitutional, uh, founding. So it's, it's really interesting what? how the game is being played. What kind of class action lawsuit do you think would be possible? Um, like, a, because I'm thinking of, for example, what PragerU is going through with Facebook and YouTube right now. Um, and having their, like, they're having things removed from uh, Google, uh, like, that are restricted. Like, stuff that's usually restricted for, um, you know, pornography and uh, profanity and things like that. They are on restricted lists, and that means that they're not allowed to be viewed by schools. They, they won't come up in, in the safe search and things like that. And PragerU is far from that. Anybody who's familiar with PragerU and PragerU's videos knows that they're very child fr- child friendly and don't contain any of that kind of material. So, like, what would it? What, I, I part of the problem that I see is that we would have to be able to prove damages. I think, and what. I don't. I don't know about. I don't know about damages. I think it's more of a freedom of speech um, and, and a lack of consistency in how they apply their platform. I, I think the the federal government, the FCC, would have to step in and, and hit all social media platforms with the fact that they are a utility and not. Uh, and not a platform. They're, they say, well, it's our platform, our house, our rules kind of thing. Right. Uh, so 
I, I think that we have to um, first take the step to to really define what this new media is. I mean, because there's rules with media itself, whether it's radio or television, that you have to provide equal time. There has to be balance. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, because we are, they are a technology company and the technology companies are really, uh, it's an interesting mix, right? From, from the standpoint that you have the social media component, but there's also innovation that goes along with it. I mean, I think one of the bigger issues is going to be, you know, it came out this week. Um, Google finally announced uh, security breach of Gmail and their calendar apps. Um, um, when like, was this? Was when was billion people? Wait a minute. When was the? How is it that I did not hear about this? When was this? It was. It was like Monday this week. It's been speculated for a long time. I mean, it's. Um, I think it goes back where I first started getting rather suspicious about it uh, was probably two or three years ago. We were brought in on a project for a company that, you know, had a, a very successful app on um, on uh, the App Store with Apple and Google Play. And uh, in talking to them about security assessment, what they needed to do. You know, you do a little discovery trying to piece together how large a network it is. And it turned out this particular company ran everything off of Google Docs, Google Calendar, and uh, Dropbox. There were no servers. There was no real network. So they had basically outsourced everything to third-party providers. So, but part of the issue that they kept having was the CEO of this company, and it's a meditation um, application. And so the CEO of the company uh, would became a bit of a celebrity through this. And people would show up at his events that were meetings, and they would show up at these were not public events. It was just places he was going in his life. Wow. And they, they kept trying to figure out why that was happening. And when they went through and they were disclosing when we were doing this discovery, they had, you know, I asked the question, I said, okay, so what are you doing for your apps? And they said, well, we're doing calendar on Google, Google Docs. And I said, okay, so any chance there's fanboys at Google that are releasing this information because they see everything that you do, everything from email to the documents that you write to, um, you know, from a third party standpoint up until about a year, year and a half ago, if you created your business plan for whatever IP you have, um, that intellectual property didn't belong to you. It belonged to Google and it said so in their terms and conditions. Right. That, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's frightening. Go ahead. So, you know, I mean, free is not always free. I mean, the joke, the joke is if it's a free app and it's free technology, then guess what? You're the product. You're the one being sold. (sighs) Your information, your details, everything about you is being sold to somebody else to pay for that app. So wait a minute, Mike, is what you're saying... (laughs) Is what you're saying that under under that particular circumstance where that person was using Google Calendar, that Google was well within their rights not to protect that person's privacy? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that that, well, that saying, legally that was I'm okay? Saying that every, I, I'm saying that every IT person reads the CEO's email. You know, you know what I mean? I do know I'm what you mean. Saying, because the folks that run the machines have access to everything. They have to have access. Sure they do. Everything. Sure they do. So I'm saying that there were some fanboys of this application, fanboys and girls, uh, of this application that probably work within Silicon Valley uh, for Google. And they shared that information with friends who shared it with friends. And that's how you had people showing up at his house, showing up at his, you know, private dinners, uh, you know, other things. But Mike, (laughs) here 
here comes naive Melanie coming into, coming into play. What what would possess someone who works for Google to share the private information of someone's someone who is famous calendar? Like what what would you be what would you be thinking? What would be on your mind? That's in, that's an insane thing to do, and I would imagine could get you fired. Well, you'd have to be able to trace it back to them. Ah, good point. That's a good point. You know, but you I know, so it, it, it's it's the same thing, Melanie, that we saw during the downturn in the economy in two thousand eight, nine, ten. Right? A lot of a lot of uh, information um, because you could sell an identity. You know, had Griffith Park in L.A. on the black market for sixty five dollars an identity. So. A lot of folks would go in and, and they might be behind on their mortgage. Um, the spouse may have lost a job in the house and they're behind. So somebody will go steal 100 identities and at $65 per, that's 6500 That's enough to pull that mortgage out of trouble. So the other side is maybe they take a 1000 Well, that's 65000 That's enough to give you a little bit of a cushion for six, eight months. Sure it is. take 10,000. And the, and the reality is most businesses, um, I would say based upon our research and, and, and the assessments that we do, I would say probably 85% of businesses couldn't tell you if it left or not. Wow. See, that's a, (laughs) <laughs> that's another thing that's completely frightening and they should be able, which is, which is why you stay in business though. Let's face it. Well, you know, it, it's one of these things you, you would hope that people would take this more seriously. You would hope that you would, they would be more concerned. Honestly, I think people have become desensitized. I mean, you're talking about the largest breaches that are out there. Um, you know, and I, I sent you this picture the other day and I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the facey chat. Um, if it will copy and move, <laughs> come on, it's not doing that. I'm looking, I'm looking, I was looking at the list because we started off with the conversation of the greatest hacks of the 21st century. And you were like, yes, yeah, so there's some uh, some breaches off that list. I guess Google would definitely be one of them. Well, Google has, has just happened, and I can't get the, the graphic to drop it in there. But it, off of that list, there's others that have happened this year. That list, you know, the, the, you know, the article that we were talking about is from a year ago. Right, exactly. It was from 2018, so, right. Right. So Yahoo is at the top with, what was it, 3 billion identities, emails, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, anytime it's, um, uh, anytime it's a free service, you're the product. Just keep that in mind. And, and, um, and back then, I mean, back then when I got a, a, a Yahoo account, I was going to call it a Yahoo account, a Yahoo account, you're not even, Yahoo's been around so long. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's about as old as AOL. Like whenever I hear somebody still has an AOL account, I wouldn't just reach out and strangle. Like, why? Why? Yep. Why do you still have an a- Are you, you're just like asking to get a hat. You're begging for a virus. Like, just, exactly. And, and so I hope anybody who is listening to this, if you have an AOL account, please get rid of it. Like what? Like, <laughs> Please. And I, I don't know how many times, because people know that I teach computers, um, how many times someone has come to me and said, hey, um, such and such happened to my email. Uh, is there any way I can get it back? Well, what kind of account do you have? Oh, it's an AOL account. And I, you, you don't want to be mean. You know what I mean? But the first question that comes to my mind is, what are you doing with an AOL account? In 2017, I think this was the last time it's it's happened. What are you even doing with that account? Do you also have a pink Motorola flip phone? Right? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you have a do you have a pager as well? Like, what? what? Why do you have that? You go, you go full dark mode and, and you know, go revert back to the 80s to remain secure. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's interesting because, like I said, at the top of that list is, is Yahoo at three billion or yeah, three billion. I yeah, it's, yeah, it's three so billion. The, 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 the breach that no one has talked about that has happened this year, uh, and it came and went. I mean, it was maybe the most strategic announcement of a breach that I have ever seen. It was it was announced on Memorial Day weekend. It was announced on the Friday at, at, after five o'clock on the West Coast. Oh, that's a typical uh, media b- Barry. Okay, on Friday Memorial Day weekend after five o'clock on the West Coast, so it's eight o'clock on the East. Okay, so it was for First American Title, uh, everybody's mortgages, right? 855 million identities. Holy all wire, smokes. All your wire information, bank account information, your property address, all of it. 855 million identities. And it wasn't even, it was off the radar by Tuesday the following week. Sure it is. Uh, if you announce it. Mentioned. Absolutely. If you announce it on Friday on a holiday weekend, you, you're you're not going to hear about it after Monday. It's done. That that is insane. I didn't hear about that one either. And, exp- and the, the title situation, the title loan situation, the uh, mortgage situation is a. I would say it's a, it's probably not a relatively new scam. It probably is just c- coming to light most recently. Can you explain to the audience how that works? What, as far as the title? As far as people taking your title, as far as people scamming, getting your information, and being able to use your title in order to get a, a second mortgage on your house or refinance your house and take and take cash out and things like that that people are doing. I, I had not started hearing about that until maybe, I don't know, two years ago. You started hearing... Well, when, somebody, when somebody came up with a service to prevent it, like LifeLock, right? That's right. That's kind of what started started driving it but you know because of all the information online now it's just like identity theft it's very easy to pretend to be somebody else and so much of what we do um in the way of of exchanging electronic data and, and, and how we conduct our electronic lives it goes back to the conversation we had before, right? It, it, what's more important is it is it convenience or security? And so many times we decide things based upon convenience rather than what's really the smart thing to do with this. You're so that's, right. That's, that's the real challenge here. And, it, and I don't care what business it is. I see it all the time in business from the perspective of, the, what helps us get to market faster? If it helps us get to market faster, convenient, then I don't want security getting in the way of that. And that it's sounds so time. that sounds so crazy. We're up against an, an, an emergency break. See now, now I'm getting I'm getting anxious. <laughs> No, we're up against we're go, we're up against we're up against a commercial break real quick. We'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. We are with Mike Fitzpatrick, who is the uh, the founder and CEO of NCX Group Security, and he's talking to us about the world's largest hacks and really how it affects our everyday lives. We'll be back in a few moments. Making a living can be tough these days with so many jobs going overseas. If you love numbers and puzzles and want job security, you can become a tax specialist with an amazing six-month tax course from Tax Mama. Operate your own tax practice locally or anywhere in the world where there are American taxpayers. It's a great way to write off your trips to visit family for months at a time. Everything you need to pass the IRS three special enrollment examinations is included in this course. Visit irsexams.school. And if you need more than six months, that's okay. Take your time. You're in the course until you pass the exams or until you unsubscribe and reject Tax Mama's emails.
Right now, you can get the credit you deserve. Just visit MrCreditRepair.biz. Let their expert credit repair specialist remove late payments, charge-offs, collections, even old bankruptcies fast and easy. That's MrCreditRepair.biz. Why go anyplace else? Increase your credit score today. At Mr. Credit, you always get a quality service all at our everyday discounted price. Stop getting turned down for cars, credit cards, or even new homes. Visit MrCreditRepair.biz today. That's M. Our credit repair dot biz. Your credit repair is our number one priority. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Hey, this is Michael Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. Join us for the right way with Shannon and Mike. Monday to Thursday from 7 to 9 a.m. Right here on SHR Media. Why are they joining us? For fun things like sports, politics. Oh, maybe some news and entertainment. And all kinds of other things. Money, recipes and events, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so join us Monday through Thursday, 7 to 9 a.m. here on shrmedia.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. And we are speaking with Mike Fitzpatrick from NCX Group. He is talking to us today about uh, the world's largest hacks. And while we were at, on our commercial break, Mike, somebody asked a question in the Facey chat. They wanted to know whether or not phones can be hacked. And I said, I believe that they can be hacked, but we are going to ask Mike that question when we get back from the break. Oh, I see that. I see that you uh, are replying in a facey chat that yes, phones can get hacked. Now, um, I, I thought I typed in the facey chat. We'll ask. We'll ask Mike. Apparently, I didn't. But um, I, I actually would like to know a little bit more about that. I think a lot of people don't realize that phones get hacked. I've heard of say samsung phones getting hacked and i'm not just saying that because i'm team apple or anything like that but i've never heard of an iphone getting hacked so tell us a little bit more about uh phones getting hacked okay so the fitzpatrick rule of security for the last 19 years is if man made it man can break it Mm. there's always somebody uh that's going to have a better idea it's a lot like football um, you know, uh, we security folks are playing defense all the time. The offensive side of the ball is adding an Odell Beckham, um, you know, go down the list of all the great wide receivers or quarterbacks or Zeke Elliott or Saquon Barkley. You know, they're adding folks that are going to attack and attack and attack every year. We have to be right all of the time. And we can't miss. So it's it's an interesting um, give and take, if you will. So to answer the question about phones, yes, phones can be hacked. Um, the uh, the primary source for a hack is uh, is an Android operating system. Boom! Um, That's what I thought. <laughs> I'm yeah. Sorry. So I mean, night, and, and it typically comes through. Uh, malware on the Android platform. So 97% of all malware on a mobile device uh, is on an Android platform. Primary reason is that Google doesn't vet any of the software uh, that is put on the Google Play Store. Really? Uh, yeah, really. Um, the, the other side of this is uh, a lot of the malware apps are positioned on Google Play Store as apps that prevent malware. Wow, that's dirty. That's just not, that's not cool at all. Well, you know, the hackers are not stupid people. They're smart people. Um, And whatever it takes to get the information, get the information that um was known or needs to be known they'll they'll do and it'll it'll come through an email a, a phishing attack it'll come through uh a number it may come through an app that gets downloaded it may it's any number of ways you know it's it's interesting and probably about 
three months ago, we, you know, we do some work for some, some high end, um, uh, personal protection firms out there on the cyber and we do it on the cybersecurity side. And so we, I got a call on a Saturday night and it was like seven o'clock at night and, uh, you know, they needed somebody to do mobile forensics. Well, we really don't do mobile forensics, uh, more of the, just the system side of it, but, um, they needed somebody to be able to get on a plane, one of their high profile executives, um, you know, they thought had, uh, been breached via malware on his cell phone and, um, couldn't tell me where we were going, how long we would be gone. You just need to meet at this airport and um, bring your tools. Yeah. And so um, we ended up passing on that job, but I heard who it was later on. Um, and I can't really say anything about it now, but uh, man, it would have been extremely high profile. Absolutely high profile. Yeah, I I would yeah. I could understand why you would want to pass on a job like that if you're thinking about it. Um, if you're thinking about the long game, I and and not not just thinking about the money. I could think of a few reasons not to want to do a well, job I, like I, that. And I was flat told the money is no object. Wow. But also, but oh. also, whatever it is you're getting involved in, you just don't know. Well. You know, again, I'm not I'm not sending my people into to things that we don't know and fully vet and all of those things. Right, you exactly. Know, and, Just say go so we can get as much. Got, they've all got families, and and uh, you know, my job is to make sure that they get home safe, and, and uh, there's no issues. That is amazing because I you I, I don't think, and I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of my listeners are as a little bit as surprised as I am that that. that what you do as a cybersecurity expert on some levels can be dangerous depending on the client and depending on what people are trying, what people are trying to do. Well, I mean, you got to, I mean, today the enemy is, is, it's not like war games with Matthew Broderick down in the basement with a pee pad. And you want to play a game. Um, it's, it's organized crime. It's state sponsored actors. It's uh, terrorists. It's nation states. It's, it's some really bad people. Somebody said and Bill and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I still can't get over that she's speaking at a secure she's speaking at a security event for a security vendor. And it's like, oh my God, have you people lost your mind? Yeah, that's well, listen, I guess her advice is gonna be take out a hammer. <laughs> And and commence to banging on the you know banging on the phone like what, what kind of cybersecurity advice could she possibly give people? How to get away with security breaches? Uh, I've got friends at FireEye. FireEye is the one that's paying her to be there, and it's like I want that hell. Yeah, you know, and and I mean I I Well, that's, you know, that, 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 that's a strictly, I mean, how do you invite someone like a Michelle Obama or Hillary Clinton to any kind of event like that? And it not be super partisan. Like, I, like, how are you a corporation, which I would think any corporation is supposed to be a little bit like neutral politically, but, but that's, but people, people are not like hiding their partisanship anymore. They're just doing, no. companies are just doing whatever they want. Now it used to be, you know, people kept their political leanings kind of uh, uh, under the cuff, you know, and that was like a really private, personal thing, but not anymore. No, and, and, and I mean, it's, you know, 
we do a we try to do a good job of being middle of the road because in some in some respects you know we end up being father confessor uh for a lot of these companies because by the time we're done with them on engagement we know more about them um how they function how they uh, they communicate with each other, what their belief systems are, where they're strong, where they're weak. We know more about them as we leave than they know about themselves. Wow. Now, and, go ahead. And so it, it's important to us, it's important to me that we play it straight and be that advisor, be that advisory voice. Tell them where the edge of the cliff is and when it's time to jump off the wagon before you hit bottom. So that's that's the way we that's the way I choose to approach it as far as uh, my firm is concerned. Now, speaking of going of confession, I noticed that number three on the list is adult friend finder, number three on the world's biggest hacks. <laughs> now, I don't know. I don't know what is more upsetting, shocking, clutch 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 my pearls worthy. Uh, the fact that uh, 412.2 million accounts were affected or the fact that there's 412.2 million adult friend finder accounts. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, I'm not familiar with that uh, particular app either. Uh, apparently, it's a friend finder network for casual hookups that include several different um, adult outlets like Penthouse and, and Strip Show and all kinds of other stuff, which I d- just happened in 2016. But quite frankly, I heard of the, the one where you hook up with mistresses, but I had not heard of this one. And I guess that's a good thing. But apparently there's 412.2 million people out there who have. And could you imagine? Funny. Go ahead. Well, the funny thing is the Ashley Madison one, that's the one you're talking about. Right, right. Uh, is, is not on this list. Now, how did that? How did they manage to avoid that? How did they manage to avoid? Wasn't that a pretty big one? How would they have managed to avoid getting on that list? I wonder. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of important people that were on that list that <laughs> um, had it omitted from this article. Um, you know, the, it, it's funny because the one that, that uh, you know, Equifax is here, that was actually 455 million. I don't know why they're saying 145 million. That's just not, that's just not correct. They have a friend um, at the, at this company, apparently, whoever wrote this. <laughs> they, uh, and then you've got, uh, you know, still on the list and the one that everybody still recognizes is Target. Um, it, it is. Uh, it is absolutely astounding to me because I still use Target in my examples when I uh, do presentations and talks for, for um, different industries. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, I remember Target. And, and I still use cash when I go in there. It, it's, it, is, um, it is absolutely amazing the impact that that breach had. And that has everything to do with the timing of it at Christmas. Right, right before and, Thanksgiving, right. Yeah, so it was right after Thanksgiving, um, and, and it, it came through a social engineering attack, a physical security attack. Um, somebody was paid, and somebody uh, went in as part of an HVAC group, uh, used a thumb drive, loaded the app to the servers there in Target's data center, and that started to propagate the app for the credit card skimming to all of the credit card terminals everywhere within Target. Wow. Now see. So, no, go ahead. That's, that's how that, that's how that got done. Um, it, it's, you know, TJ Maxx, I mean, that one goes back to, to 2006. That was a man in the middle attack for all. Uh, credit card transactions, the hacker basically set up a gateway in the middle of it where all the credit card transa- transactions got funneled through to this one corporate site. And as they were coming through, he just skimmed off all the numbers. Wait a minute. This guy had been working as a paid informant for the Secret Service. <laughs> 
the guy that did the, the guy that did the TJ Maxx hack. Yeah, that is insane. That is absolutely crazy. And apparently, Uber had a cyber attack too, and that that's huge. Who doesn't use Uber? Well, I mean, there's certainly less people using Uber here in California with the fact that California just passed an anti-independent contractor law. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see what happens with Uber and Lyft. See, they'll have to make all of those drivers employees now. Why doesn't California just secede and get it over with? I mean, honestly. Um, <laughs> I mean... Uh, honestly, I, I, I can't figure it out, but. Um, it, you know, the whole thing is, is, is really interesting because the, the, the one, the other one that's not on this list that happened within the last, um, two, three weeks is Capital One. I think it was 108 million, uh, identities, credit cards, all of that. Uh, and that one I love is it was one of their software engineers. Oh my and gosh! She, she, the the one that did it, that stole the data, uh, went into a couple of uh, forums and bragged about it. That's how people get. That's how people get caught all the time now. But but is it really worth doing? It's a real name. It, it well, that's stupid. I mean, I had somebody steal my identity too, and they paid their own bills. Like they stole my checkbook. It was in my office, like tucked in the back of my drawer. And they paid their own bills with it. Like who, do, like, who said that they were the smartest people in the world? The criminals were the smartest people in the world. I, I, I don't know. Listen, we're, up, we're go, up against the close of the show. Before we go, please do tell people how they can avail themselves of, uh, of your services. And tell them about your podcast, too, because it's really awesome. And to follow you on Twitter, because you post a lot of really good stuff on Twitter. Okay, go. <laughs> Thanks for sharing the stuff. All right, so if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you, the best way is through our website, and that's ncxgroup.com. Uh, you can follow us on um, all of the social platforms at NCX Group, uh, whether that's LinkedIn, whether that is Twitter, whether that is Facebook or Instagram. So, uh, and then what was the other thing you wanted me to No, uh, your podcast. Oh, the podcast, yeah. Uh, Bite Size Security on Anchor FM. Uh, and, um, you know, it's now on Spotify, iTunes. I have to actually get back to doing that, but it's, you know, it's been an interesting year with everything going on, but, um, it, you know, we try to talk about security in short bites in five minute segments, segments, uh, and, um, you know, just take a topic, spend five minutes on it and, uh, make it bright size, make it digestible. They're really good. You guys should check them out. You should follow him on Twitter at NCX Group because he he tweets some really good, interesting stuff, some interesting articles, very interesting information. It is definitely worth it. You should do that. Well, Mike, I can't believe that hour flew by so fast. I am so glad I got a chance to talk to you. That was great. Finally. I know. I know. I know. A girl was, I had a really, really ridiculously busy summer, and now I'm finally starting to get back into the swing of things. But uh, awesome. it, uh, it's great to be with you. It was it was great to have you on the show as usual. Thank you so much for being here. I know your time is very valuable. That is my next guest coming up. Thank you so very much. You have a great weekend. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live here from Cape May County. That was Mike Fitzpatrick from NCX Group. I hope you enjoyed that hour with us. We're going to go into a commercial break. And in the next hour, we will have uh, Anne Ballou. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. She will tell me. She's an emotional intelligence coach. She's a writer for Forbes, an international speaker. She's written over 26 books. She's going to talk to us about why emotional intelligence is the answer to rising strong. I'm so excited to have her on the show. If you want during the break, you should check her out. You should check her out on YouTube. She's fantastic. We'll be back in a few minutes. From a public locker inside a dilapidated Long Island rail station comes the show designed to piss off liberals using truth, facts, and ridicule. The Lynn Radio Show, featuring the conservative voice from the People's Republic of New York, the Lynn himself, Jeff Dunnett. 
Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on the SHR Media Network. Go to shrmedia.com. At Lynn Radio, we fight for the truth, the justice, and a good kosher T-bone. If you don't listen, Hillary Clinton might sneak into your bedroom in her house coat late at night and blame you for her election loss. It's the Lynn Radio Show with Jeff Dunnett. <laughs> Hey girls, Carry Girl Gear is here. More and more women every day are concealed carrying, participating in competitive shooting, and firearms training. And it's not a boys club anymore, and we don't have to shop in their stores anymore either. Finally, a cool and unique clothing line just for women. Dope tees and hats for the patriotic concealed carry and 2A girl. So what are you waiting for? Go check out CarryGirlGear.com today. It's your business diva here, Melanie Collette. I am inviting you to a front row seat as I discuss some of the most intriguing details of wealth and finance with today's movers and shakers in the world of business. Listen in and discover financial truths on a global, domestic, and household scale. Uncover topics that will impact your wallet today and in the future. Money Talk with Melanie airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West, right here on SHR Media and High Plains Pundit Talk Radio. You can't afford to miss it. New show on the SHR Media Network, Sackheads Against Tyranny. On shrmedia.com, go there quick like a bunny, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, every Wednesday, live and direct. The SHR Media Network. SHRmedia.com. Be there. For 50 years, I've seen the American people blinded by corrupt politicians, a left dog media, and deceptive Islam. The one thing the elites fear is one man with a cane. I'm Dave Milner. Join me through Spreaker, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Through SHR Media and the Western Free Radio Network for half a century of experienced perspective on political and social issues weekly on the Unpleasant Blind Guy. And catch me on Jeff Mitchell's EDL Radio on blogtalkradio.com. There's no surrender ever. Because truth is not always pleasant. Broadcasting behind enemy lines in occupied California, a mere two miles from the state capital, the bloviating Zeppelin's Berserk Bobcat Saloon Radio Show can be heard every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 p.m. Pacific and 11 p.m. Eastern, only on the SHR Media Network. Go to shrmedia.com to listen. You can also watch on the SHR Media Facebook page and the SHR Media YouTube channel. No goldfish were abused in the making of this ad. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, and I'm broadcasting live via SHR Media and streaming live on Facebook. Welcome back to the second hour of Money Talk with Melanie. Before I continue any further, I I always forget to do this, forget to tell you guys this. I do have (laughs) Money Talk with Melanie actually has a website. Guess what it's called? MoneyTalkWithMelanie.com. Guess what else? If you want to see my live videos, you rather watch my face for some bizarre reason rather than rather than listening on iTunes or Spotify or downloading it um, via any of the, of the other podcast platforms. You can go to my YouTube channel and all of my live videos are posted there on YouTube uh, at Money Talk with Melanie on YouTube. I have not mentioned my website or my YouTube channel yet. I have not recently mentioned my two uh, Twitter handles. If you want to follow my political musings, you can do so at NJGOP Diva. Uh, that's on Twitter. Or if you want to follow the show at Money Talk Mel. You can follow me there. Those are the two uh, Twitter um, places that you can follow me on Twitter. I already have 5,000 friends, but if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can do so at Melanie Teresa. Melanie Teresa is my personal page. So you've been warned. 
Um, but if you want to just know, get finance information and stuff like that and keep up with the show at Money Talk with Melanie on Facebook, you can certainly follow the show there. At, but I, I always forget to promote all of my social media. I am also on LinkedIn and, and Pinterest. And, uh, I think I, I think I covered everything. LinkedIn, pitch, Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram at Melanie <laughs> at Money Talk with Melanie on Instagram. I'm there too. Okay. I think I covered everything. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my next guest. Her name is Anne Bolu. Uh, and she's, she's got a, a lovely accent and she speaks three languages, but that's, I, I, I'm just so impressed by her and so excited to have her on the show. She's an internationally accredited emotional intelligence coach with the Coach Training Academy and the Certified Coaches Alliance. She's also an accredited coach with the International Coach Federation. Besides being an expert in the field of emotional intelligence, she holds a bachelor's degree in in translation, a master's in economics, and is a chartered financial analyst. Uh, I am very excited to have her on the show. She's written 30 books, uh, 30 e-books in the thriving series called Emotionally Emotionally Intelligent Way. So without further ado, Anne Bolu, how are you? Thank you for the warm introduction. Oh my I was god! Listening to that, and I'm like, holy moly, I've been busy. Uh, you, you know, whenever I do a media hit, I feel the same, and that's probably not all of it, is it? That's just like the most succinct version of everything that you've done. If you're anything like me, that's not even close to all of it. Pretty much, pretty much. It's like people say, "Give a short bio," and I'm like, hmm. How many lines? Exactly, exactly. Did I leave anything out? Is there anything that's going on recently since since you wrote that that bio that you'd like the audience to know before we move into the, the the emotional intelligence and how important it is in business and how important it is to rising strong? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one, I got uh, accepted into Forbes, so I now write uh, write for Forbes. On uh, on the subject of uh, have what it takes to have a good relationship with money, the emotional intelligence beside, behind it, and uh, I'm also opening the uh, national sales and marketing conference for Kawasaki in Canada. Excellent! So, pretty cool. See, I knew there would be more. There's always more. <laughs> <laughs> There's always listen for. <laughs> There is. And listen, I checked you out. I checked you out on YouTube and checked out your website, which is just fantastic. I'm going to post her website is walkinginside.com, walkinginside.com. I'm going to post the link in the Facey chat. I'm just really excited to talk to you. You just have such a, you have such a great energy. And I know that your focus is on, on women, but I'm going to guess that this information is good, whether you're male, female, or otherwise. Correct. Correct. What we do is what we do, regardless of gender. It's the way I explain it to people. They're like, what is emotional intelligence? I'm like, well, imagine you have a laptop in front of you or your cell phone and you go on it and you open, I don't know, let's say Word or Excel and you go and you do, you do your stuff on it. Your mom comes in, uses the phone, the computer, your dad, your life partner, your kid does the phone differently because it's a different person in front of it. And people look at me and they go, no, it behaves the same way. I say, it's the same for us. What we do is what we do everywhere, no matter what we think. And emotional intelligence, it's deeply knowing that. It's, it's regard knowing that no matter who's in front of us, no matter how good we think we are, we behave exactly as to what our programming says. Okay, you're gonna to need to say it again for the people in the back. That because that and, <laughs> and the, reason, the only reason why I'm saying that is because it really is a deep thought, a, a profound thought, and it's important. And I don't want it glossed over. So say that one more time. Okay. For example, uh, I'll just I'll just take me as an example. In the past, I have very little emotional intelligence, but I thought I was emotionally intelligent at the time. So I was the type of woman I used to be where I was a perfectionist. Everything had to be perfect. I, when I did the laundry, I would take my towels and I would fold them like corner to corner. I 
I would clean my kitchen counter. You could eat off the floor. And yet, I went to work and I looked at my boss in the eye and I said, I am a team player. I am such a team player. I will work with people. I love people. But then when the new idea would be presented, because I, I would go and shut it down, I would find what was wrong with it. Instead of working with it, I wanted the idea to be perfect. So that perfection, I took it everywhere with me, no matter what I claimed. Okay, I'm, I'm, right now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna like massage my toes because they're hurting a little bit because you might be stepping on. Them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna give my toes a little rub right now because I feel like you you may have just stepped on my toes just a little bit. Just saying. But you probably have stepped on a lot. Of, it's so true. You've probably stepped on a lot of people's toes. Now, I, I don't know. Do you think that emotional intelligence gets increases as you get older, decreases, or does it have to be an active thing that you do? Like you have to realize I need to pay attention to my emotional intelligence in order to grow in that area. Because I think like I used to say that I like people, but I do know now that I don't. <laughs> has nothing to do with physical age, nothing to do with it. I, children, are highly emotionally intelligent because they own their feelings and emotions. I remember, I'll tell you like a short story and I'm sure people can relate, is I, I was at this park and I was, it was quite, quite a while back, it was years and years ago, and I was depressed. And I was like fully depressed and I had gone to that park, it was pissing rain that morning and I sat against the tree, don't ask me, it was raining, but hey, that's what I did and, and I was crying and I couldn't stop crying. I was just so sad. And then this little boy and their caretaker walked into the park and he was about three, four years old. And at the time I, I wiped my tears really quickly because I didn't want the kid to see me cry. I didn't want to think, him to think that, hey, what's that lady doing there? sitting on the ground crying and and he had gone to towards this swing and there was this blue swing and he started howling like shaking and I'm like what the heck happened to this kid he was just looking at the swing and he didn't go to his caretaker he came to me so I'm still sitting on the ground and I'm pretending like oh I'm cool I'm okay nothing bad happened and and the kid looking at me like deep sobbing and this knot out of coming out of his nose and he's like some, somebody pooped in my swing. And I went, what? <laughs> somebody pooped in my swing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you know what? There, there's, there's that toy over there. That, that might be really great. It was one of those uh, climbing walls. And I said, maybe, maybe you'd like to do that now. And you look at the at the at the wall, the climbing wall, and he had this big sigh out of him, and this grin came on. It was fascinating watching him. And he was like, that's a great idea. And he went to play so happy. Children are emotionally intelligent by nature because they own their feelings and emotions. They fully feel it in the moment. They're happy, we know it. They're unhappy, we know it. But we adults, we hide. Because we think that's the mature thing. But looking at me back then, the kid, the kid was right. The kid had it. I had, I was the one who needed to really own my feelings and emotions at that time. I think that sometimes what makes you cry is that you're not feeling the authentic emotion. Like that is actually like you think that you're crying because you're upset, but that's not really what you're crying about you're crying because you're not really you because you're trying to suppress what you're really feeling if that makes any Correct. sense at all yes it does absolutely back then if you had asked me and why are you crying oh, i'm so sad this this and this and this and that and and so on full martyr on full victim but those tears are what i call ego tears uh -oh. Are the tears that ego, we all have an ego mind because we go inside our mind and we replay.
play a tape over and over and over again that makes us sadder, sad, sad, sadder, or angrier, but I over resentful. But that tape is just a program. It's just a perception, a, a feeling. A feeling is like a bubble. It's like that kid. He felt it fully, and it was done under 30 seconds. And it was like that fascinating uh, into a book that I read, The Stroke of Insight. And, and in the book, they were saying that how long does, when we get angry, when that bubble of anger biologically rises inside of us, we've all gotten angry when we get the shakes and our face turns red or whatever, and that, where it is, up to 90 seconds. After 90 seconds, the body, the physical body is done being angry. Really? So what the heck is going on? Yeah. 90 seconds. Scientifically proven. Our body can only stay angry 90 seconds max. Okay. After that, we choose to be angry by going inside our head and replaying a perception over and over again. The child that day felt his anger, he felt his sadness, and he let it go, which allowed him to feel joy. But us? We replay old tapes over and over again. We remain in that poop poop that was on the swing, <laughs> right. thinking that we're actually being mature. But it has nothing to do with age. That kid that day taught me more about owning feelings and emotions. And I was a grown up woman. That is very interesting. I'm absorbing what you're saying. And that makes so. I, I, I think when as you get older, though, and when you're an adult, you reflect back to the last time that such and such happened. This is just like when such and such happened last time. And so let let me go back and relive that while I'm at it. Like, like while, you know, while I'm already yeah, upset that, about that this. Our reflections, I always pay attention. Is it truly a reflection? Like, am I, when I go reflect, for example, and I like to call it contemplate, when I contemplate something, when I observe something, is it with the, with the, the intent to heal myself or re-wound myself? Wait a minute. Is That's it, vastly different. That is vastly different. And the fact, I, I, I've never even heard, I've never even heard it considered or I I will let me allow me to rephrase. I had never even considered this for myself that you're reflecting with any intent. A lot of times I don't even think we're considering what the intent is, let alone considering whether the intent is is an either or situation am I reflecting to, you know, repunish myself from the last mistake I made or am I reflecting in order to, you know, um improve and move forward. I I don't think oh that we do either a lot of times well i did not and i was i was trained i eat my own pudding and i have an eq mentor who's been mentoring me every week for the last five years i just hired him on a two-year contract so i do eat my own pudding because what we do is what we do and he taught me about reflection everything we do as an intent and i remember looking at him like a fish in a fish bowl you know like my mouth open and and swallowing air with the big goggle eyes, because the eyes going like, how do I know whether I am healing myself or hurting myself? Like back then I was so confused. And it was like easy. When we heal ourselves, if we feel, if we reflect on something and we feel that pain, we feel the truth of something. He says, it's like chip and dip. Everybody has ever had chip and dip, right? Right. So when we dip that chip into that dip, do we leave it there for half an hour? Of course not. No. Because the chip's going to become all soggy and it's not going to taste good. So when we reflect with the intent to heal, it's a chip and dip. We dip into our truth, we feel the pain of it, and we make a decision in that moment to do different and we take action on that. And then we feel this vastness, we feel empowered. We feel like, oh, we're getting unstuck. We can move forward. But when we dip that chip, when we reflect with the intent to wound ourselves, we will leave, we will dip into our truth. We will feel sorry for ourselves. We will just cry and bitch and do all that jazz <laughs> for a long, long, long time. That, kid, that, that chip gets so soggy, 
we lose our spine, we lose our nerve, we become anxious and worried, and and we become fully stuck. And then we just be wounded ourselves. So it's very crucial when I when I go into my past, because I have a very horrific past, anything you can imagine, I can probably top it like 10 times. And, and so I'm very, very clear that if I go into my past, to dip into something, I must make sure that it's in the with the intent to heal myself. Otherwise, why on earth would I do that? That does not make any sense. You're right. Like, why why would you do that if it's going to be harmful to yourself and if you can actually control it? But I, what I think the issue is for many people, and including myself, um, and that is that many people don't think that you can control it, or at least when you're in the heat of the moment, the heat of the battle, that battle within yourself, you're not thinking that you can control it. Control what? You that you can decide whether or not you're going to heal yourself or not. I think that many people don't can cons- don't stop and don't. Oh, first of all, don't yeah. stop. Don't stop. They just do agree. do what they do, yeah, like you said. Choice. It's a choice. Exactly. It's it, a choice. It's that simple. It's a choice. So before I go there, I have a few conditions with myself. Number one, I choose to heal. So therefore, if there's anything in there that will tend to work, because we know we're smart enough. We know when this feels wrong so for ourselves. We know when we're hurting ourselves. It's like that person who goes for that third tub of ice cream that day, you know, thinking that's going to heal their breakup. No, we know we're hurting ourselves in that moment. My toes, my toes. With the mind, I choose me. I choose me. I choose my well-being. I choose my well-being. There were days I had to say it a hundred, a thousand times. And then gradually it trains the mind to look for to look for evidence that it can heal itself. We upgrade the programming in the mind. It's hard work. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it. They'd yeah. rather go through life miserable, playing small, blaming and shaming everybody else around them for what they perceive as their misery, when in fact, we, each of us, are the common denominator with every experience that we have. We create our own reality. So why not choose our well-being first? Now, do you think I, I was having this discussion with my sister actually last last weekend and we were talking about a birthday last weekend. Um, and I was having this discussion with my sister about um, how people waste their lives. I said, I'm amazed that people waste their lives and it, and they don't eat. And my sister said, I don't think they realize that they're wasting their lives when they're doing it. I said, there are people who are sitting around just existing. I said, here I am. I'm in my, this year will be my 50th birthday. This was my 49th. I said, here I am. And I'm thinking about, okay, how am I going to, not in a despairing kind of way, but like in an exciting kind of way. Okay. How am I going to get done whatever my life purpose is? And I'm, I, I'm like, I don't want to waste time not doing that. And some people are, and my sister said, some people are just in survival mode. And that's why they're not thinking about the things that you are, that, that you're thinking about. Because I'm, I'm thinking, what a waste of a life if you're just existing. That just seems to be kind of a waste if you're not proactively deciding what it is that you're going to do. And I, I'm wondering if emotional intelligence plays a role in that and connecting to what our life purpose is, how how we turn that life purpose into hopefully into some type of income and making a living and, and, and kind of living that way. Our connection to money and, and not having that emotional intelligence. Is it possible that if you're in survival survival mode, that that somehow taps down your emotional intelligence? Is that possible? Well, you asked, uh, we're going to unfold it because you asked a long question. I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Right. I did. When, when it comes to purpose, let's take purpose. Purpose, if you go inside your mind and you think, why am I here? Why am I here? I want to find out why I'm here. Pointless. I 
our purpose, like my mentor taught me, is found in our pain. Whatever causes us the most pain in our life is what is going to give us the fuel to change it. That's what we know best. That's what we have the most life experience. So purpose is always found in our pain. So we must be willing to feel our pain in order to tap into our purpose. And unless we're willing to feel our pain, then a lot of it is we're going to stay on survival mode. And people on survival mode, they don't like it when I say this. For example, if they come to me and they're like, well, I want more money. I don't know how to make more money. It's so hard to make to make ends meet and everything. And I say to them, do you have a toaster in the kitchen? They go, yeah. And I say, would you let your toaster dictate your life? And they look at me like I'm some kind of idiot. <laughs> and, they go, and they go, no. Why would I let the toaster dictate my life? Okay. Would you let your fridge dictate your life? No. Well, I said, your fridge is like your mind. What you store in it is what you're going to eat. If you don't like the food you're eating, if you don't like the results in your life, I check what's in the fridge. That's... And in that moment, people have a choice to make. They either invest in finding out what we call the blind spot, finding out the limiting beliefs that they have that prevents them from having more money. Because, see, a limiting belief is anything that prevents us from reaching our full potential. And, I, and I'm going to give you an example. If I were to ask your audience today, do you believe money is hard to make? People might say, yeah. Hey, is it hard to make a penny? No. Is it hard to make a dollar? No. Is it hard to make $10? No. Okay. Can a child make some money selling lemonade on the street corner? Yeah. Okay. For a belief to be true, it has to be true 100% of the time, past, present, and future. So if there's a part of you that answered no when I said, is it hard to make a penny, a dollar, ten dollars, and you said no? Then it's easy to make money. Because even a child can make money selling lemonade. And that puts a wedge in people's mind and you go, wait a second. Who taught me that money was hard to make? Then they need to go back to their childhood. Who did they hear? Was it their mom? Was it their dad? Like I grew up ghetto super poor. My, my shoes had holes in them and, and my clothes were bought in my basements of, of churches. And my parents fought constantly about money. So I grew up with the mentality that you curse the money when you had it and you curse the money when you didn't have it. And that was a terrible, terrible example for me growing up, how to manage money. Because we take all those beliefs, all those in impressions with us. And until we really dip that, that dip into the dip, that we see how that belief holds true for us, then we'll continue blindly applying what the programming taught us about money. And no one does this work alone. That is... We can read all the books you want about money, but we all need help. That's why your show is great, because you help people expand their perspective about money. I do, and I, lo I love doing it, too, especially especially when it comes to economics and politics. And I, I do it with a Christian worldview. And that's the next thing I want to ask you about. Do you think that having having a high, for the sake of people who are not Christians, and but my audience knows that I talk about being a Christian and my Christianity, but for the sake of those who aren't, do you think that it's important to have a higher power in your life in order to have emotional intelligence? Or do you think there are people who are atheists that still are able to have emotional intelligence? 
I know that was kind of a deep question, well, but I'm curious what you think no, about no, that. It, it's, uh, my, my take on it is this. I believe, it's my belief, I believe that we are greater than the sum of our parts. We are not our history. We are not our physical body. We are something much greater than that. We're all connected. I believe we're like avatars. It's other movie. I believe we're all emotionally connected. I believe we're all energetically connected. We're all in this together. And even if one of us, just one of us, believes in a higher power, in a way, all of us believe in it. That's why, if you remember one of Buddha's teachings, he said, at the time, I didn't understand when I read it. I thought that was very idiotic, but I understand it now. He wrote, the murderer lives in me. And I did not understand that. I was like, the Buddha, how can he say that? <laughs> right. And now, and now I understand that we're all emotionally connected. And, and that- we are only as good as the weakest link within us. And weakest doesn't mean like, weak in strength or weak in everything if weak for me means emotionally wounded now that's interesting i'm glad that i brought this up because my dad um was a buddhist unfortunately he passed away um years ago um but he was a buddhist and i've i've been a christian since i was 21 years old um and so needless to say me and my fa- and my father was a highly intellectual person uh, he was a psychologist. He died while he was writing his dissertation for his PhD. Really smart guy. Uh, but he was a Buddhist and I'm a Christian. So we had the the best conversations about things like that. And I, I strongly believe, I, 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 of course, as a Christian, believe Christianity is number one. And But what he and I used to do is talk about the parallels between those two and basically the things that we had in common, just religiously speaking what we had, what it was that we had in common. And I, I, I believe I liked what you said about us um, sharing the same energy. Now, the way I would interpret that as a Christian is that because we were created by the same person, that's why we have the same energy, if that makes any sense. Um, and so... It, yeah, we're all connected. We are all connected. Exactly. So I understand... What you do, what you do in practice? We may be in different countries right now, but I feel you. And so what you do impacts me. And what I do impacts you. I deeply believe that. That's why I'm doing my work. That's the stuff that brings me to my knees. Because I never want, never, I never want to hurt another human being again. That's, that's, that's what my voice breaks. That's why I do the work. I do the work for myself and I help my clients to become better versions of themselves. To create it together, we get to create a better world. And you really do. I think those of us who think about, okay, how do I want to impact the world before I leave here? Just want to kind of leave the world a better place than when we when we got here. You know, like the hopefully the world will have been better off for you having been created. That's the that's the way I look at it. And so, how does not having emotional intelligence block us from things like? business success and we talked about money but as far as like picking a career and having having success and and removing those blocks how does emotional intelligence help us that way okay i will share my personal experience briefly i grew up in a household where my mother was psychotic she was clinically insane she believed she was pregnant with a child of jesus christ i did not compete with uh, my siblings, I competed with ghost children. My father was a sociopath who carved whips out of winter tire to break the back of his children. So I'm just going to say those two things about them. So you can see how terrorized and just as a small child that I was of these adults. Sure. And so, so, and anything you can imagine, I like rape, molestation, like all that shit happened and more. And so in my mind, in my child's mind, I was, I I was intellectually brilliant. And I was like, I'm going to, at the age of eight years old, I told myself, 
I'm going to become so damn smart that no one will ever hurt me again. I will overpower everybody. I will make sure that I see them coming. I became like an FBI profiler. I would see you in front of me. I would know which nostril you breathe, you breathe it in and which muscle twitched on your forearm. I had to watching my father growing up because I never knew when he would have his next fit. That was a matter so of survival that, for you. Yeah. So that's full survival. That's like a trapped animal that's turning into, into like the, the, the chaser, the hunter. So I became super smart. I have, oh goodness gracious, 18 degrees in certification. So anything, anywhere I walked in, they're like, holy moly, that woman, she's so smart. But I was so disconnected. There was nobody home. There was no life home. I was just an empty shell. No substance. But I was so damn smart that I would intimidate through sheer aggression. If I felt tricked in any way, shape, or form, I became aggressive or passive aggressive, whatever it was. So without, I had no emotional intelligence. I had no compassion for the child inside of me. I had shut down emotionally a long time ago. I had exited that building. I went decades like that. Decades. I got married, built a white ticket trend. Financially, I had it all. I, I have three children. And my children were getting angry and I didn't understand. I was physically there, but not emotionally present. And it took me to meet, if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, it took me to meet Morpheus. <laughs> and Morpheus showed me what I was. This empty shell that refused to feel the pain. And in that moment, I looked at him crying and I said, then I should be locked up because I'm no different than my father and mother. And I collapsed and all my rage and all my anger at everything that I had suppressed uh, that I did not feel growing up. I was feeling it. It was like a tsunami of crap. And, I, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Some people call it the dark night of the soul. I just dropped on my knees. I stopped coaching. I stopped working for a while. I just kept crying. And it was like, what have I done? What have I done with my life? What have I done with others? What's the purpose of this? Why so much pain? But I knew at the bottom of that pit, that bottomless pit, was that little girl who was so scared growing up. And I had the courage to go pick her up. And my life changed overnight. It wasn't easy, but I saw the light. Like they said, I saw the light. It was like somebody flicked the switch on and my world became 3D and super bright and the giggles came and I, I was ready to help other people like me to walk inside their mind and help them turn the light switch back on despite the pain, what they may have seen growing up. And that's done through emotional intelligence, feeling all of our feelings and emotions, knowing where our feelings and emotions come from, knowing who taught them to us. There are no new feelings. Managing our relationship with ourselves through managing our feelings and emotions, which allows us then to become aware of the feelings of others and managing the relationship we have with others. Now, you just said something really, it makes perfect sense. You just said something really important there, um, which is to manage your feelings. In other words, I think what you're saying is not only do you, is it okay for you to have them, but you have to acknowledge the fact that you have them and manage them like you would manage anything else in your life. Correct. I mean, I'll, give you, I'll give you a quick example. I have this client who came to me that triggers, trigger, any triggers you have, it's unresolved. And I had this client who came to me and she was like, oh, I said, what's a trigger you have? And she was like, oh, I cannot stand people chewing loudly. You know what I mean? Like when I sit at the table and they go, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> it drives me nuts. I, I want to go down their throat. I want to punch their face. 
And she went on this rampage. She was totally triggered. She was back at that kitchen table, dining table. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, where does the trigger come from? And she went, but it's people. No, 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 no. Where did it come from? When did you first have that trigger? She went, huh? So she thought that I was nine years old. My father, my mom and my dad, they had separated. And my mom started dating this guy. He became my stepdad. But I love him. I said, no, no, keep going. And she was like, yeah, but he sat at my, in my father's place. And I hated him for it. And he chewed his, his food loudly. Mm. So I said to her, your trigger has nothing to do with people chewing loudly. It has to do that another man sat in your father's place. She went, holy shit. <laughs> and then turned around and she was like, I am fine. Anybody else can chew now? <laughs> <laughs> everybody can chew, everybody can chew freely now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Exactly. <laughs> that is um that is amazing and um and of course, you know, this is at this age, this is not the first time that I've heard things like this, but I'm thinking to myself that there are many many people who are walking around blindly, not even considering things that tick them off. And 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 why why the things tick them off, myself included. You know, I I, I would say about myself, and my guess is that people who know me would say, "No, sister, wrong." Um, <laughs> that I that I very rarely get angry about anything. I that's what I would say about myself. I get upset, irritated. I think I complain probably way too much um, about little things that are not even a big deal. Um, but that's something that's always something to examine because it's good because on some level it's going to block you from your success. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. See, feeling is a tap. So I want you to think of it this way. Feeling to me, anyway, feeling is a tap. The tap is either on or off. If you had met me 30 years ago, I never got angry. No matter what you said to me, I had heard way worse. I had been called every name in the book. My father was like the C word. Bingo. So was all the time. The little F that. And, and I grew up with that. So no matter what people told me, I was just like, okay. Okay. And I used to drive people nuts. Why can't you get angry? Because if I got angry, it would be a tsunami of it. I was scared of my anger. Yes. When I connected with the anger, it came out. And it was a tsunami of crap. But instead of turning it towards others, I turned it towards myself. I imploded. I just kept crying. I just, I just became like completely, completely stuck. But anger, there is such a thing. And I would like love people to get this because it took me decades to get it. There is such a thing as healthy anger and unhealthy anger. The healthy anger is a 90 seconds. That feeling is there to tell us that we've been hurt, that our boundaries have been breached. That's all it is. It's like a sign on the road saying, hey, slow down. There's a pothole here, a big one, and you've got hurt in it. Unhealthy anger is when we cannot let the matter go. And often when we cannot let the matter go, it's because we refuse to feel the pain underneath the anger. Because if we found that pain, then we would have to speak up about it and say, my feelings are hurt. And moving forward, this is what I need. People have a hard time doing that. It's rather just call people names and, you know. Well, that's much more fun, at least for the moment. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, but at what cost? But at what cost? You're the cost so is pretty high. And it's not just wanting to be right. It's ruining relationships. It's teaching our children that it's, uh, it's like I ask people, well, at the bottom, bottom line, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Amen. What's more important to you? That is very true. 
That is, I, I actually use that phrase all the time too. It's not always about being right. It's about being happy. And sometimes you just got to, there, there, you got to pick your battle. Sometimes you just have to dummy. I, I call it dummying up and that's probably not the best thing to call it. But if you are legitimately more intelligent than the person that you're dealing, than you're dealing with, th- then sometimes you do. I, I call it dummying up and just letting it go. It's not, you know. Yeah, in, that, in that moment, these people, whatever irritates us, I used to think that people were, oh, what am I saying? But I realize now that I live in my mirror. Remember we talked about energy earlier? Yes. I live in my mirror. What I see that is beautiful in people is what I see that is beautiful in myself. And what irritates me about people is stuff that is unresolved within me. If it were resolved, I'd be a cool cucumber. I'd be okay. But if I'm triggered, so now instead of uh, picking fights with those people, I just my hands and I said, touch the hands because I need to talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you, how do you feel? I had a guest say something very similar a couple of weeks ago. And what she said was that a lot of times when things trigger us, it is because we are, ex- it's because we are exactly that way. Like it's a, it's a reflection. And that, that stopped me in my tracks because I was like, ew. <laughs> Yes, I was like, I don't, I don't want to hear this because that would mean that you know, there's, there's things that I, I don't like, and that means that's me, and and probably people are going, well, she's got a lot of nerve because she does that all the time. How's she going to be mad at me when she does that all the time? Well, you do. I do me. Everybody does themselves. <laughs> it's true. Um, John Campbell in the Facebook chat wants to know if if a t- detaching emotionally is a healthy thing. Is that considered emotionally intelligent? It's a great question. There is a vast difference between detachment and non-attachment. Uh, detachment, detachment is we shut down emotionally if we refuse to be hurt. We're interested but instead of being committed. Interested, being interested, I want you to imagine, is being on the diving board. It's 12 feet high, there's a pool below. You're looking down and you go, wow, I want to jump. But you're not sure. So you're looking at the pool and you don't jump. That's being interested. So detachment, it's often, I'm going to stick around until it hurts me, or I don't know, or I'm unsure, or I'm insecure, but then instead of moving through my own insecurity, I'm just going to walk away. That's being interested, and that's never good for the human spirit, because how do we grow? The non-attachment is being committed, is we care so deeply, we're so committed, but we're committed to upholding the greater good. It's like we love someone, let's say, and they break up with us, and we say to them, I love you so much that I'm going to let you go because I want you to be happy. That's commitment. It's being committed to being happy and upholding the happiness of others. So non-attachment is one of the hardest things to practice, but it's part of emotional intelligence as well. So non-attachment is much better than detaching. That's two different things. Non-attachment is caring deeply. It's being fully committed to increasing our well-being and the well-being of others. Detachment is when it does not suit me, I don't say. I'll just walk away. Yeah, and that's that so that is not good. Detachment is the easy way out. Oh, I like the sound of that. I'm kidding. I'm I'm totally I'm totally joking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us like the sound of that. At first, at first, we like the sound of that because we think that, and I also think that sometimes we confuse um, detachment with non 
non-attachment. Like we think that we're being um, undetached or non-attached, if you will. But really what we are is detached. And if we don't r- recognize the difference, that's probably another area where we get ourselves in trouble. And does that have to do with how much we've grown emotionally or grown in our emotional intelligence? Yes. Yes. Because we are the vessel. So the depth the level of commitment that we show to ourselves, to ourselves, to upholding, to feeling all our feelings and emotions and taking positive action on those feelings, our commitment to ourselves to grow, to learn, to honor each other, that level of commitment, that's the depth of our relationship how much we know ourselves, how much we can manage our feelings and emotions. That vessel, we're the vessel. So the depth of that vessel determines the depth of the relationship that we have with everyone, every single person. I often ask people, how many relationships do you think you have? And they have, I have one with my kids, with my last partner, with my dog, with my cat, with, no, you have one. And they go, what? You have one relationship, one. You're the vessel. You contain all the relationships. So the depth of our relationship, we can be either a chakra or we can be an ocean. But there's only one relationship. Whoa. (laughs) That's deep. Aren't you glad you invited me on your show? I am. I am. (laughs) And one of the things about having a guest like you on the air is uh, occasionally I forget that it's a radio show and that dead air is a bad thing. But you will say, but a guest like you will say something that's so deep that I have to stop and think for at least a second or two about what the next thing is I want to ask or I want to say because I want to make sure that it meets the depth of the comment, if that makes any sense at all. Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. I've, I've been on shows where the, where the podcast host said she was dead silent for two minutes, and I actually thought she had injected. Like, Hello? You thought the call she dropped? Like, wait. She was like, wait, I'm taking notes. <laughs> Uh, it, it, right, exactly. And sometimes I do that too. Believe me, I'll, I'll be going back and listening to the show again. And I, it's one of the things, I don't know how you feel about going back and watching your YouTube uh, videos or things like that, but it's one of the things I really don't really care to do, but I know it's a necessary evil. I don't like the sound of my own voice, which is ironic because I do radio. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, there's her voice again. I don't really care for my laugh. And people are like, oh, my gosh, your laugh is so great. I'm like, really? Because, okay, if you say so. John John, John in the facey chat um, says how does he wants to know how self-awareness figures into whether or not you jump off the, the diving board. That's an excellent question, I think, because I think self-awareness. It is an, can, excellent, it is an excellent question. So in the past, for me, I was interested. So a lot of my relationship, I would stay in, like a romantic relationship, I would stay in until the the, the poop hit the fan, until I felt insecure. I felt, oh, my God, I cannot deal with this. They want so much more from me. I cannot give them that. Remember, my childhood, I had shut down emotionally. So for me, receiving love was, was a big deal because then I felt I owed them. So I was full of fear. So I stood on the diving board, full of fear, looking down, and I played small because I was scared. I did what I thought had the minimum impact, but I, I had a small life. The day that I said to myself, F that F word, that trash, <laughs> and I jumped. I jumped. I stole myself. I mean, all the way down but holy moly I'm going to feel that water on my face that was the day I became committed so that level of awareness was me knowing yes I am scared shitless yes I'm being a coward in this moment I get it yes I have compassion for myself 
I see the little girl in me, why she is scared. And now I'm going to step up because there's an adult in me and that child needs a champion. So it's like I picked up myself and I trust it and I jumped and I never looked back. Excellent. Excellent. And that was a great question. Thank you, John Campbell, for that. We're up against the close of the show. Before we go, please tell people how they can get in contact with you, how they can follow you uh, on social media and et cetera. Want to make sure that we get and where we can get your next book, too. Okay, Uh, you can find me on walkinginside.com. So just one word, because life is a journey with them. So I like walking. And so we walk inside ourselves every day. So walkinginside.com. I'm on Facebook. I am on LinkedIn. Feel free to send me a request. I'd love to, to have you. My name is spelled A-N-N-E. And my last name is spelled B-E-A-U-L-I-E-U. And in English, Beaulieu means beautiful place. Oh, that's awesome. That was meant to be. That was meant, it was meant to be a parent. <laughs> that was meant, that was meant to be. Peace. That was peace, beautiful place, but nobody sent me that memo growing up. <laughs> well, listen, I appreciate you being on the show so much. You really, really did an excellent job. Very, very informative. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank uh, you so much for inviting me, Melanie. Thank you. I'm, I know we talked today. We talked a lot about. Uh, emotional intelligence and, and maybe less about money. Next time we can talk more about money we, in relationship with money. We sure can. We sure can. But I have a feeling this is going to help people with their money for sure. It does. Because what we do is what we do. Absolutely. I, I, I'd be happy to have you back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. That was Annabelle Yu. She was wonderful. I'm so glad that we were able to connect and able to have her on the show. The first hour, if you missed it, Mike Fitzpatrick was here. We talked about the world's biggest hacks. He did a fantastic job warning us once again about how to stay hack free and um, how to keep the cybersecurity tight in our lives. I'm glad that I had both guests on the show. I mentioned it earlier in the first hour, but I want to mention it again. I need to do a better job at this. If you want to follow me on Facebook, you can do so at Money Talk with Melanie or at Melanie Teresa. Or if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at NJGOP Diva or at Money Talk Mel. If you want to follow me on Pinterest or any of those other places, Money Talk with Melanie will do the trick. I want you to remember that all of this is so very important because after all, it's your money. Have a great weekend.